Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce Jeremy Gamson, a fifth year PhD student from uh, UMass Amherst. During his summer with us, uh, this summer he built this uh, audio and accelerometer sensor based uh, user gesture input device on, that works on a ring platform. So, Jeremy. Thanks for the introduction, Bodhi. Um, so, before I came for my internship this summer, I knew I was going to be working on some kind of ring platform. We weren't exactly sure what the application was going to be, and what we converged on was doing gesture recognition. And we do that specifically by doing something called sensor fusion. So I'll go more into what that means later. Yeah, so over the last 50 years or so, I mean, we've seen this rather obvious trend where we have computers that are kind of very far away from us that are you know, coming, coming closer to our bodies, right? So in the 60s and 70s, we're using dumb terminals and maybe you know, remotely accessing uh, computers in a, in a remote data center. Uh, Personal computers kind of emerged in the 1980s where people actually own their own computer, laptops. We finally had computers we could carry with us. Smartphones have been really popular over the last decade. And then, as we all know, kind of the big trend over the next 10 years is wearable computing, uh, where we can think of devices like Google Glass. Like there was someone wearing that around uh, the building today. Uh, there's the Pebble Watch, which got a lot of exposure uh, through uh, Kickstarter. And then uh, augmented reality. So that's the Oculus uh, Rift platform that you can actually wear and experience augmented. Uh, sorry, not augment. Uh, it's like virtual reality for playing video games, right? Uh, so what are so we want to push this a little bit further and have a platform that's even less obtrusive. So something that you could wear every day and maybe not even notice that it's there. So why not a ring, right? So in popular culture, this has been kind of a very popular thing that you have this ring that kind of gives you some kind of magical powers, right? So in the 80s, there was this television show where these kids had these rings and they could summon a superhero. Uh, there's this guy here, the Green Lantern. He can create force fields using a ring. And then, of course, we're all familiar with Lord of the Rings. You, know, you have this magic ring that lets you disappear. Um, unfortunately, I learned very early in the internship that superpowers aren't going to be feasible. Um, the big reason I can think why right, is the energy bottleneck. I mean, if you wanted to do all of these things, you need to store a lot of energy in a small ring. So on the left here, uh, this is a ring prototype that Bodhi had actually built. And it has a small area where you can use buttons to enter inputs. Um, and this is a picture of the battery that's actually part uh, that's in the ring. It's underneath the board here. And it only stores about 1 milliamp hour of energy, which is a pretty small amount. Uh, so the trick that you use to keep this ring powered, um, so here, if you can see it, uh, there's uh, some copper windings, which is actually an inductive charging coil. And the idea is that you can recharge this small battery kind of opportunistically. So if you're wearing the ring on your ring finger and you're holding your phone, a lot of phones now have NFC. And you can kind of opportunistically recharge the ring's battery when you use your phone normally throughout the day. So actually, this year at uh, Movisys, so Bodhi and I had a paper that explored that idea in a little bit more detail. So we were looking there at a security application. Um, the big takeaway uh, that's kind of relevant to this work is that we found that using like a very aggressive harvesting strategy, we can harvest up to 30 milliwatts of power from a phone. So that's a lot of power when we compare kind of the low power consumption uh, costs of sensors now. So this is an opportunity, right? So we have this remote charging source that we can use to replenish the small battery on a ring platform. OK, so what do we do with the ring? Uh, there are a few ideas that we explored early in the internship. So the first was continuous. Uh, health monitoring. So one thing that we thought about right, was monitoring uh, you know, something like a, like a pulse ox sensor, or maybe doing galvanic skin response to understand someone's emotional state. Um, unfortunately, so we found that a lot of, uh, at least, uh, so we, we found that the signal integrity that you need uh, you know, for those different uh, health-related health things, um, for various reasons, I mean, because the surface area on the, on the ring is so small, for example, for galvanic skin response, that would mean the electrodes would need to be very close together, and you get a very weak signal, which isn't necessarily good for detecting health. And so that also kind of, we have this idea of doing emotion-based HCIs. Maybe you can detect that a user is frustrated, and then maybe somehow 
you know, change web, web search results, something, something of that nature, right? Um, but but we, we couldn't do that because we couldn't implement those sensors. Uh, so instead, we focused on this idea of uh, a gesture, the ring as a gesture input device. And there are actually a, a, you know, a couple of uh, ring-like things out there that do this. They're a little bit clunky, right? So the thing on the left there, that's basically a miniature trackpad that you can wear on your finger. So I, if I was giving this talk and I wanted to be able to flip through my slides, I could do that from a ring. But we think that we could do better and have something that's much more you know, seamless and something that you might want to wear, you might be willing to wear all day. Uh, so yeah, our project goal right, is to implement a ring-based, always available data input device. So we can think of data input in a variety of ways. So first, right, there's UI actions. So say you're in a web browser. You want to navigate back and forth between pages that you visited. You, know, you, could, you could implement those gestures, maybe scrolling up and down in a page. That would be another, another two gestures. Another way you can enter, enter input is kind of like a virtual keypad like we have on our phones. Uh, so you have a virtual keyboard, and you, you can enter in individual letters. There's more advanced ways of doing this. Uh, it's called shape writing is the general. Yep. Can you talk about doing uh, auto unlock on my phone through the, through the ring? Do you know yeah, what I mean? There are, there are okay. some. There's actually a couple of applications out there where I've seen there's a ring that kind of has uh, just a, uh, a passive NFC tag in it, right? And basically, when it sees that tag ID, it does some single action on the phone, right? But we're looking at doing you know, more than just one action kind of you know, a, a richer set of, of inputs to a, to a device. This, this is a problem that we all have at Microsoft. Yeah. Um, just right. related to that, actually, um, there's another project that William and I is doing with uh, some people in Silicon Valley um, using okay. that uh, the security, part of the yeah. security. Yeah, yeah uh, so what we're going to be focusing on in this talk is kind of, um, Kind of the, 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 the two last cases here, so character input and shape writing. So basically looking at characters as shapes, right, and trying to detect those, those shapes accurately so we can emulate characters. So there's obviously a variety of challenges in getting something like this to work effectively. So the first challenge is related to energy. So how do we keep the ring always available for input when we're only relying on you know, this harvested power from a phone and a small battery? Uh, so the second is sensing. So if you have sensors that are located you know, in this segment of maybe the index finger or the ring finger, uh, you, know, you might not be able to get uh, good, good gesture, gesture, you know, accurate sensor readings to have good, to good uh, accurate gesture recognition. So the third is computation. So how should the ring process the raw sensor inputs? Should you do all the processing on the ring? Should you do some processing on the ring and then, and then push those results and have you know, something that has more computational facilities uh, do the rest? So um, this trade-off between computation and communication is also important, right? Otherwise, you'll end up killing the battery on the ring. Yeah? How about user perception? Which? Uh, if, if I'm holding the phone ring, is it easier for me to interrupt the phone through my ring? Or just have my thumb on the phone touchscreen because it's already there? How about the perception of me looking at a device and providing input to the device on a different plane that is not in front of the device? How do you think the user perception might come into that? Do you think people will feel comfortable doing that? So you're, you're saying so you have some kind of remote display, I'm wearing the ring, and I want to be able to interact with it. Your phone, a remote display, a touch screen, PC, a touch screen laptop, anything. I think another important factor here would be the user perception. How does the user... Sure, yeah, that would be a fifth challenge, right? Yeah. Like touching a touch screen through an actual finger that is not in his clear visible field. Yeah. Yes, that, yeah, that would require you know, a, a, a user, user study to, to understand what that is. Right. OK. So there are several different approaches towards entering uh, symbols on different types of devices. So, kind of, so BlackBerry is kind of on its way out, but it was really popular because it had this very accurate uh, tactile uh, method of input where you have these keys that you actually press. So a few advantages of, of pressing buttons, right? You, you can do this at really low power. You're basically processing interrupts in, instead of you know, having to continuously process sensor data. Um, it's very accurate, right? I get nice tactile feedback when I, when I push a button. You might be able to be faster with buttons as well in, key, in, in entry. Uh, a couple of limitations are form factor, right? So if I want to have a lot of buttons, I need a lot of space. If you're thinking of something like a ring, you don't have a lot of space to work with. Uh, and, then, and then how do you map a rich set of symbols? So if you are kind of uh, constrained in terms of space, how do you have like a rich set of inputs, right? 
another thing that became popular, I think starting with the Nintendo Wii a few years ago, is doing gestures in 3D space. Uh, one of the advantages here is it's very verbose. So you can move your arm in very large areas and do a lot of, a lot of different types of gestures. And these motions might be uh, really natural to people. Uh, but one of the issues here, right, so there's, there's lack of intent. So say um, if I'm wearing a ring and I wanted, and I wanted to process things in 3D, uh, you, might, you don't want the user to have to press a button, right? So I'm moving my hands around all during the day, and I don't want these spurious movements to be misinterpreted as gesture inputs, right? So, so this is a problem. And uh, these can also be low accuracy, right? So it, it's kind of hard for me to kind of perceive where I am in this 3D space in front of me. Like if I wanted to accurately reproduce a gesture, it's not exactly clear where the exact boundaries are. Uh, you also have to deal with things like, like variable orientations because you're in 3D space. And then this can also be higher power because you have to stream out maybe a lot of accelerometer readings in order to localize the thing in 3D space. So the third way that, we, that, that, uh, that you can consider is doing something in 2D space. Uh, so one of the advantages is, so this is one of the first things that we learn in school, right? Uh, so handwriting. We learn how to write letters on a flat surface. Uh, so some of the reasons why, why this, is, this is attractive, right? So you get haptic feedback. So when I'm uh, sliding a pencil on, on a surface, I can feel the vibration through the pencil into my hand, and I know maybe how fast the object's moving. Uh, if I'm thinking of even just writing, doing finger painting, right, I can feel my finger on, on moving along the paper. So this is something natural because I mean, people have been doing this, you know, for ages. You look at like cave paintings and tablets. I mean, this has uh, been happening for a while. And surfaces for doing this are available all around us, right? So if you aren't restricting yourself to like capacitive touch surfaces, you know, maybe if you're considering tables, uh, whiteboards, Maybe even it could be uh, your, your trousers, right? It could, could be a, a 2D surface that you would use to enter input. I mean, it's always readily available. So a couple of the, of the challenges here, right, are surface detection, right? So how do I disambigu disambiguate my hand is in the air or when it's actually on, on a surface, right? That, that's an open question. Uh, so it's less verbose than 3D. So I'm kind of constrained maybe to a smaller space where I can, where I can move my finger in a comfortable way. And then uh, power is a question, right? So we don't really know uh, how much power it's going to cost to do this surface detection. OK, so how does, uh, how does a, a user input 2D gestures on a ring? Well, so this is uh, our idea of how you would do this, right? So step one, uh, so the user will initially tap on the desired surface, right? That's when you first put your finger down on the surface that you want to interact with. Step two, so this is actually an optional step. This is, this is just. Um, so you have this challenge, right, that you need to understand what coordinate space you're talking about. So the user might first have to enter some reference gestures to let the system know kind of how the user is oriented relative to the surface. And then thirdly, uh, the user enters a series of strokes on the surface to interact with some other device. Okay, and then the fourth step, which the user doesn't do and it's implicit, right, is they stop entering strokes and then the ring will go back into a low power state where it's not interpreting gestures anymore. Uh, so with a one uh, milliamp hour battery that will actually fit in a ring-like platform, um, so based on some back of the envelope calculations we did on hardware that's available on the market that we actually used to do some prototyping. Uh, so we found that given 3,700 uh, 3, microjoule battery capacity, you can do around 4,000 gestures on a full battery. And uh, given our previous results on NFC harvesting, you can recharge all that energy from the phone uh, in about 20 minutes, right? So the idea is that you're using your phone periodically during the day, and that battery will kind of keep being topped off. And then when you want to do another type of interaction without the phone, there will be energy available for you to do that. So we haven't actually evaluated how effective that is. It would require like a longer term. You'd have to have people wear these things and understand how often they use their phone. But that's another, another topic. OK, so the first challenge that I want to talk about right, is segmenting gesture data. Right? So we need to know when one gesture starts and another stops. Right, so this is just me um, sitting at my computer, and I'm sliding in my trackpad. And I'm actually inputting an up gesture right now. Right? But it isn't clear from the video, at least, whether I'm moving up or down. Right? You can't really tell when my finger is raised off the surface or when it's down on the surface. It's kind of this. This fuzzy notion, right? So, so how how do we how do we do this? Uh, well, doing this, um, there's there's two main challenges. So, the first of which 
is detecting whether or not the finger is on the surface. Right? So first we need, we need to know whether it's up or it's down, and then, and then if it's on, or, that, or if it's on the surface. And then the second is distinguishing between different gestures while the finger is moving on the surface. So we know that the finger came in contact. Now what is it doing while it's on the surface? Okay, so the first part of the talk is going to be how we detect a surface. So related to those steps that I showed earlier, uh, we want to first detect when a finger lands on the surface. So a great way to do this, so you, uh, you use an accelerometer, right? So what you look for is a sudden deceleration in the z-axis, right? So when the finger stops when it hits the surface, you'll see a spike. And one of the, the great parts about currently off-the-shelf available accelerometers is you can do a threshold-based wake-up for very low power costs. So for less than a microampere, um, you, can, you can determine you know, when, these, when these spikes occur. And then uh, the second part is continuing to detect the finger as it moves across the surface. Um, so surface friction, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, emitted, it's emitted from most surfaces as audible band-limited noise, right? Uh, so what we're doing here is we're using a low-power microphone and some signal processing techniques to observe the surface friction noise. And we're able to do this at reasonably low power consumption, less than a milliamp with an, with an optimized circuit design. And what this lets us do, so if you combine this with the accelerometer, another added benefit is it reduces false positives from spurious taps. So say if I'm wearing this ring and, I, and I'm nervous and I'm, I'm tapping you know, on, on the side of my trousers, you'll have a lot of false wake-ups and waste a lot of power. Um, so in order to keep the system up in an active state, what you look for is a tap followed by the surface friction noise. And if you don't hear both, you, you quickly turn the system back off. It's woke up, or some sort of, I don't know. Like, uh, I know that there there isn't or... one in the prototype now, but you could envision, you know, maybe quickly pulsing an LED, some, something like that to give. Or... I see. Yeah. So, so for, the, for the accelerometer, the Z axis is always like uh, vertical, or you can actually redefine the Z axis. You, you can actually use. You don't just have to use the z-axis. You can, def and I think it looks for actually any of the axes. I just said z-axis here because I'm assuming you have a horizontal surface, and maybe that's the one you're looking at in particular. But so the wake-up power is it for the ring itself? The wake-up power. Uh, so that is just for the uh, just for the accelerometer, right? Uh, so I, I'll have a slide on uh, a, a number for this a little bit later. But basically, you are in this low power state where you have everything asleep. The accelerometer is using only 0.27 microamperes of current, uh, and it's just it's just listening, it's just waiting for these these spikes. But what about the band-limited noise? I'm going to have more slides on that. Uh, yeah. So, all right, go on. Okay, so this is our initial experimental setup. Uh, so I have to be honest, it's not a ring yet. Uh, that's kind of a work in progress. Um, but but uh, what we built here. So this is a bicycle glove I bought at the Commons, and this is a uh, it's a commodity uh, accelerometer on an evaluation board, and it's in, it's in the location on the glove where a ring would be located. So the sensor data that you get from it will be reasonably close to what you would get from a ring. Um, and then it's connected to a microcontroller that's, that uh, basically outputs the accelerometer readings over a serial port. We also have a low-power MEMS accelerometer basically on the other side of the finger, on the opposite side of the finger from the accelerometer, and we basically are outputting all of the data from that microphone into a PC sound card so that we can analyze you know, what these surfaces sound like. Why did you use the index finger? So the index finger is easier to write with. Yeah, but nobody wears rings on their index finger. <laughs> they might. <laughs> they will. <laughs> <laughs> they might. Yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah, it's possible that you could do it on the ring finger as well. Um, maybe maybe the, the motion between the two are correlated, but we started with the index finger. All right, so, so the first part, right, of detecting the surface, right, is, is the finger impact. And what this is, is this is just a time series trace of data that I get from the three-axis accelerometer. And these spikes that you see, you know, around, around uh, two Gs here, that's actually when the finger is striking the surface, right? Um, so, I mean, that, it's reasonably easy to detect that, right? But what about the other part, right? So I said there are two parts. So first there's the impact, then there's the sound that the surface makes. So let's do an evaluation kind of right now here. Uh, what, so what does this sound like? So the first um, is really loud sounds. This is a piece of styrofoam, right? And this is what it sounds like, right? It's kind of like almost like nails on a chalkboard. Very loud and easy to hear. 
Um, is this going to play all the way through? <laughs> OK. And then the next um, is a surface like wood, right? You might not even be able to hear this, right? Uh, we are actually able to pick it up with the microphone. And then the other scenario you can think about, right, is when there's external noise that might be swamping the signal that you're looking for. So here's some children playing on a playground. And I was playing this sound uh, from a laptop next to where I was performing you know, a series of gestures with the ring. And I'll, I'll show in, in one slide that we're actually able to disambiguate the two, the two signals. So I actually evaluated um, 12 different types of surfaces. And they all produced some, some common frequency band limited noise. And in addition to those evaluations we did, um, I, there is an initial, there, I, we looked at this journal paper from the Acoustic Society of America, and they kind of you know, confirmed our suspicion, right? That a lot of surfaces have these common frequencies. OK. So uh, these are actually results, the, the results that I referred to in the last slide um, about you know, what this looks like when we have the noise of these children playing on a playground and then me performing a series of gestures, right? And so on the left here, so these red regions, so okay, first I should explain the plot here. So what we have is a spectrogram. The x-axis is the frequency components of the signal that we're looking at. The y-axis is the time that that spectral content was, was present. And so what we see here, all this red is the children playing and these yellow bands here that are separated by blue bands. So this is me dragging my finger across the surface for about a second, picking it up, dragging it again for a second, right? And so uh, there's, there's a lot of space here, right, where they don't overlap. One place where they do, right, so they're in, the, in the lab where I was doing the experiments, there's actually some servers on, and they generated this yellow band uh, that's kind of there present through the whole trace. Uh, but there's plenty of frequency space around that that doesn't overlap. So if we wanted to be even more uh, immune uh, to noise, there's a couple of other tech techniques we could use. So we could use something like dynamic filtering, where we have a programmable filter that can look at different, different regions of the of, of frequency content. And then the second might be time domain analysis. So you have really short-lived noise. You could filter that out because that doesn't look anything like these surface movements, right? It's much shorter. All right, so to do this audio processing, um, there's, there's three steps that we need to do. So we need to do processing, right, because the ring isn't going to be able to, to, to look at raw audio samples. You'd have to sample audio at 44 kilohertz. You'd very quickly drain that 1 milliamp hour battery I showed earlier. So we use a hardware filter. So first you uh, apply a bandpass filter you know, that, that's constructed to look at that region that's usually separated from, say, human speech. Uh, then we apply some gain, right? So we need the signal to be bigger in order to be interpreted by a, a microcontroller, say, with analog to digital conversion. And then we also want to use something like an envelope detector so we can actually sample that signal at a relatively low frequency, right? And understand when that noise is present and when it isn't present. So what does this look like after bandpass filtering? Uh, so what we see here, this is another spectrogram plot. Um, this time, I was drawing the letter L on a surface. Uh, so these red bands that you see here that are very close together, those are the individual strokes of the letter L, right? Um, yeah, so we're, so we're, we're, able, we're able to do this you know, with filtering and gain. And so after the envelope detector, we can actually see the two peaks that correspond to the strokes of the letter L. Right, so this is a promising result. So this is all implemented in MATLAB. This isn't from an actual hardware implementation of the filters. So we were kind of guided by these results to do an actual filter design. And this is what it looks like. <laughs> it's a little bit uh, of a mess right now. Um, but what we have here is, so these two boards here are the envelope detector. This one does some filtering and some gain. We have a microcontroller, the same accelerometer from before, and a similar microphone from the previous setup. Uh, so we chose the particular components that we used. So the, the um, op amps that are used for the filtering uh, are very low power. So all of them together use 620 microampers. The accelerometer, even when it's active, uses only three. And the microcontroller, I mean, I think that there are more efficient ones in the market. The one that we used is around 270. But if you sum all of those up, you, you have less than our milliamp uh, budget, right? And then in standby, right? So this is with the accelerometer in its low power mode. And when the microcontroller is also asleep, we consume around only one microampere of power when everything is kind of off and waiting for a user to interact with the surface. OK, so let's revisit writing the letter L, but this time with our actual hardware. So um, these are traces that were actually output from our, 
our serial port, right? So basically our microcontroller was just reporting uh, the ADC samples that it got from our audio filter. And we're actually able to distinguish the letter L. So these are spaced a little bit further apart in the previous plot. So this was actually uh, from an actual user. So I had a few people enter gestures for me, and this person happened to enter it more slowly than I did in the previous. But uh, because of the filter characteristics, even if the strokes were closer together, it would still work. Yeah. This is the precision, not the recall, right? You don't know what among, if I write a T, it will be recognized as L. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have a, a few results on that later. So this was just kind of to prove that the envelope detector is doing the right thing. So this is just the fact. So L contains two strokes, right? I move down and I move right. All this is showing is that I can get two strokes per L. Right? It, they might not be the right strokes, but, but there are two. That, that's what this plot is showing. OK, so to get ground truth about, about how accurate this uh, surface detection is in the movement, right? we actually used a off-the-shelf uh, capacitive touchscreen. So what we did, right, we recorded the coordinates of the finger on the capacitive touchscreen over time, so we knew whether or not the finger was actually moving. We also recorded audio from the finger from the finger motion, right? And so then what we did, we compared timestamps of the audio and also the timestamps of the touchscreen coordinates. We found that they correlated pretty well. Um, I don't have a plot here to show that, but uh, it it proved that our our uh, audio detection scheme is doing the right thing. OK, so I've just described how we detect that a finger is moving on a surface, right? So I'm going to go to the second part, uh, which is, how, so how do we construct a symbol uh, so based on you know, maybe movement on a surface? Right? So uh, one thing to note right, is symbols can be arbitrarily complex. So you think of you know, maybe not, maybe not um, American English where the characters are, are simple, but maybe like uh, so, so Japanese or Chinese. Like you can think of very complicated symbols that a user, a user might answer. So, one naive strategy you might do is you might try and put all the computation on the ring and compute the entire symbol and then tell the end device this is, this is the character that they entered. This could be computationally challenging, so you might need to use advanced machine learning techniques, things like language models. You might have to update vocabulary specific to a user. Maybe one user writes a little bit differently than another, and you might have to do customization there. Uh, so I mean, instead of trying to compute the entire symbol on the ring, uh, we break it up into a series of strokes. right? So for example, if I write the letter A, that's going to be uh, two diagonal lines in different directions followed by a horizontal line. So I would send each of those segments to the end device and let it figure out that that's the letter A. Uh, so kind of an architectural view of what we're doing here. So at the bottom level, right, we have fingers on a surface and we're detecting some signals. right? And so the ring is detecting those signals, converting them into strokes. And then those individual strokes are sent to an end device. Maybe it's a Windows phone and it's being converted into symbols and words. And so yeah, an example that I've been referring to is handwriting. So this is the letter B, the letter L, and the letter W. This is how it's decomposed into strokes and, and kind of the, order, the ordering of those strokes. And then the way that you might report this to the end device, maybe you have different IDs corresponding to the different stroke primitives you support. Some timing information, right? It might be important um, how quickly how the strokes are grouped together, that might help disambiguate one symbol from another, and maybe even in a character, like if I write the letter A, for example, the two diagonal lines might be while I'm on the surface and be close together, and the horizontal might be further apart. So that timing information could be helpful in interpreting it later. And so this is great because we can send a few bytes of data instead of sending out 400 hertz accelerometer data, which would completely kill our battery. So the two core system challenges here, right? Again. So it's identifying uh, the beginning and the end of a stroke reliably. And then the second is using sensor fusion between the microphone and, and audio circuit and the accelerometer to understand the relative directional properties of an individual stroke. OK, so this is a user that I was actually collecting data from wearing our prototype. And what we have here, so the x and y coordinates are oriented. So they're facing a table and a piece of paper. So x is positive in the right direction, and, and then y is positive in the direction facing away from the user, right? And so what the ring actually sees is something a little bit different, right? So you're going to have some tilt in the x and y. So basically, what will happen is uh, the, the, the part of, uh, uh, so gravity is detected by the accelerometer, and then it's going to be found in some set of these axes. So you have to normalize uh, you know, kind of the coordinate space of the ring to the surface. And then the other thing that can happen, right, is the user can actually uh, have their have their finger rotated, right? So that will actually confuse your x and y 
axes. Um, so, uh, so combining the microphone and accelerometer, how does it work? So, so step one, so after that tap happens and the finger is first touching the surface, uh, you can compute the finger angle relative to the surface during idle periods. That's the get rid of that uh, Z component from gravity. Um, and then the second step, right, is identifying that the finger is moving on the surface, right? So you get that audio envelope, and that lets you know when the stroke is actually being performed. And then step three, you can observe uh, the finger accelerating and decelerating in different directions, depending on what gesture the user is, is inputting. And then you can use some physics-based heuristics to figure out what that direction is, right? So I mean, if you, if you want to move a finger, you have to accelerate. If you want to stop, you have to decelerate. So the accelerometer is going to definitely pick up those signals. So kind of a laundry list of different stroke primitives uh, that, we, that we want to deal with. So first, there's the easy ones, right? So there's up, down, left, and right, where basically you're just looking at the signs of the different axes of the accelerometer. Um, then kind of a medium difficulty, I call it medium because you need to actually look at combinations of the, of the x and y axes to detect what type of diagonal motion you're talking about. Um, and then the third is hard. I call it hard, right, because now we're actually, we actually care about kind of the shape of the accelerometer motion, right? So you can detect things like centripetal motion um, in order to understand that a, that a curve is happening as opposed to a straight line. Um, so during the course, so we want to do all of these. That, that's the end goal. Um, during the internship, internship, we focused on the easy and the medium difficulty strokes. Um, so now I'm going to go into kind of how this works. So this is data from an actual user uh, performing an up gesture. So the red plot here is the output of our envelope detector, right? And so what that lets us do, right, is so say if you set a threshold, when you look at your analog to digital converter and you see that the voltage went above, say, 0.2 volts and goes back below 0.2 volts, you decide, OK, that's the boundary of when the finger was moving. And then I can draw a line down the middle, right? So there's the first half of the stroke and the second half of the stroke. And so what we see um, in black and green so we have the uh, x-axis in green and the y-axis in black. We actually see the finger accelerating and decelerating. So we have zero. So um, because the axes are actually backwards here, so negative means acceleration and positive means deceleration. But if we look at the two halves of the finger movement, right? we can, we can clearly see this by looking at the uh, y-axis. And that signal is much larger than what we're getting on the x-axis. right? So we can probably figure out that that is a vertical motion as opposed to horizontal. Um, so let's look a little bit more at this, right? So I just took away the envelope detector plot, and this is just the accelerometer. And so basically what we do, it's very simple. Um, we look at both halves of, the, of those intervals, t1 and t2, and we do an integration, right? So we integrate the first half of the x-axis, second half of the x-axis, and do the same thing for the y, right? And so based on the uh, relative signs of those integrations, and then which one where the total integral is larger than the other, right? we can determine which axis had the motion and what direction that was, whether it was forward or backward or left or right. And in this case, we did up, so we see the, uh, the prominent axis is the y-axis. Right? Yeah, so this is what we did. We, compute, we compared the integrals of the dominant axis during the two halves of the movement period. The y-axis? The, the what is the figure? Is that the integral? Or? Yeah, that, that's computing this, this, this integral, right? So it's negative. Is that a flat? <laughs> so basically, I'm just, I'm just summing over the whole thing, right? And then representing that entire sum as kind of the uh, sort of the, you can think of it as like the average, I think it's the average speed, right, over the, over the first half. The total integral value as what I computed over that half. Your, your gesture is from bottom to top and yeah. then return, or just up bottom to top? Just bottom to top, and then we define down as top to bottom. Then why is the acceleration on the... So okay, so, so it, okay. Um, th these are actual, this is the raw data, right, that is from the ring. But because I know how the, how the accelerometer is actually mounted on the ring itself, I, I actually, so in, in software, you can, you can reverse the axes and figure out right, right, the sign uh, you're looking for. This graph. Sure. On the, on the envelope. You yes. have it going, hitting the peak, mm -hmm. and then coming back down. Mm -hmm. so this, uh, this is just the magnitude of the audio right. signal, right? So would, oh, so during the peak, it's actually transitioning from yes. bottom to top. Yes, exactly. So I'm speeding up during the first half of the finger motion, and then I'm slowing down. And you'll see the gestures finish when your finger's at the top. 
You don't bring the finger back. You do not bring the finger back down. That's right. Right. So then. In order to do up, down, left, and right, it's a rather simple process. So I just filled out a table here for the signs you're looking for. So say if you correct for the axes, so what you're looking for is an initial acceleration in the y-axis and then a deceleration um, in the y-axis. And you're looking for basically no activity in the x. The opposite is true for down. And then you look at the other, uh, the x-axis uh, for horizontal movements. And uh, you can come up with a very simple algorithm right? that that does the integration and then, and then compares which axis is dominant and what the sign is. So this isn't, this isn't too hard. Um, so one of the advantages right, of only looking at these four gestures is that you're relatively immune to rotational drift. So there's 90 degrees of difference right, between, say, up versus right or right versus down. So if the person kind of drifted when they were entering the gesture and maybe entered something that looked like a slight diagonal line, you would get what they intended and actually get up. So one of the cons, though, is you're limited to four features. So that's not to say that we couldn't say, string a bunch of these horizontal and vertical primitives together to do something more complex. So you, you can do that, but you might want to have a richer set of strokes to begin with. Yeah? How did you select the voltage threshold of 5 So it's not actually that sensitive to that threshold. So basically, the important part is picking it to be the same on both sides. So as long as you pick 0.2 volts on both sides, you're going to have a symmetric view of the motion. And when you do the integration, the math works out. So you want something that's wide enough right, to be able to see as much of the signal as possible, but not so wide that you're actually you know, getting some of the accelerometer noise as part of your computation. Well, another way to say that is right now it is based on simple heuristics and observations, but we won't extend this thing to more for machine learning kind of approach, right? Yeah. OK, so, so to understand how well this works, um, so first we looked at four gesture classes, up, down, left, right. Um, so I had five uh, helpful people enter gestures uh, for me. And I looked at these four gesture classes. So I asked the participant to basically enter one of these gestures uh, ten, 10 times in a row for, for, each of, for each of the gestures. I collected all the data with the glove. I outputted it over the serial report. And then I analyzed it offline using MATLAB. So basically what I did is I implemented that simple algorithm in MATLAB and saw if I could you know, reliably determine which gesture was which. So for one user, um, this user did particularly well. Um, we, we calculate, so we compute the correct uh, gesture uh, among, among, the set of, among the set of gesture gestures that are available, 100% of the time, except um, one time we computed, uh, we, we falsely interpreted the uh, down gesture as a left gesture. Right? That's not perfect. I mean, not, not for now, but just to look at you know, if the user, the input, so how are they actually interpreting it? Like that, 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 that's actually a great idea, and I should have done that. Uh, so what I did do, so after each user was done entering the gestures, I took pictures of their hand and kind of what kind of orientation they were using during the whole session. But to understand the dynamics while this was happening, that would have been really valuable. And the next time I collect data, that will definitely be something I will do. And then uh, when we look across all five users, of course, things degrade a little bit, but not by much. So again, we confused the down and the left gestures a little bit, a little bit more. So we, we went down to an 86% uh, accuracy there. They were all right-handed. So the glove only, it's a right-handed glove. So I didn't actually check, but based on the. <laughs> yeah. OK, so if we add a little bit more complexity, right? Um, we can think of doing diagonals. And the way that you do this, um, so first, right, we have up, down, left, right. And they look exactly the same as they did before. But then we kind of have this fuzzy notion right, of where you're, if you're doing a diagonal line, you're going to see some amount of activity in the x and then also some amount of activity in the y. And if you're asking people to do diagonal lines, um, if they were drawing a 45 degree angle and if your calibration is correct, you should see the same magnitude. right? But in reality, you know, users, as they input the gestures, they're going to drift a little bit. They might actually even rotate their, rotate their finger. Um, so they might be entering the angle correctly on the table, but then you misinterpret it because your axes aren't aligned anymore. And so in this case, the user uh, was entering a down right stroke. This is after I do the integration. You see you know, a comparable amount of activity in both the x and y axis, but the signs are opposite. So that's how you figure out kind of the, the directionality. And yeah, as I mentioned, it's, it's very susceptible to individual user variations. 
and also to finger uh, rotational drift. So, uh, so the first you know, could be fixed if you had a scheme that kind of adapted to different users, if you used one of these more advanced machine learning techniques. Uh, and also, uh, that, that, that type of approach could also help you handle more of the rotational drift. If you actually wanted to completely solve the rotational drift problem, if you wanted to completely solve it, you would have to add a gyro. Uh, but that, it turns out that gyros right now cost significantly more power than an accelerometer. So, I mean, we're trying to avoid using that. It's certainly something that you could add if you were willing to deal with the bigger battery. So first, I'm going to look at what I, what I call the best user. So they actually got almost 100% accuracy across all eight gestures, right? So in one case, uh, so it is the down gesture. It was misinterpreted as a down left. And that's, you know, that's a reasonable mix up, right? So maybe when they went down that time, it looked more like a 45 degree angle than like they were going to down. Yes. Yes, it was. It was neither myself or Bodhi, I might add. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when we add all users to the mix, so things actually degrade significantly, right? So in the worst case, um, so when we're entering, it's the up right gesture, right? So we only get it right 54% of the time. 20% of the time, we think that it's right. And then 26% of the time, we think that it's up. Right, so they were pro so some of the users were probably entering an angle that looked more like uh, right than than a diagonal, uh, right or down than a, than a diagonal that's in between. Um, so this is something that we want we want to address in the future using some lightweight machine learning approach. Um, SVM was actually one of one of the suggestions that, that came to us from a machine learning expert. Um, but I mean, this is an encouraging result that this, that this is possible, right? So this is good enough that maybe machine learning can help push it up to maybe 80% plus accuracy. I don't know. Um, right. So are the users uh, instructed before the experiment to like, uh, you know, try to draw like, straight lines? Yeah, I wasn't specific. I didn't say draw a 45 degree line. I said draw, uh, go, you know, draw an upright gesture, right? So maybe, a, yeah, if I was more clear, maybe I would have gotten more accurate results. But I wanted to kind of. I mean, I wanted to observe variation in users. So how do people actually use this thing? Okay, just yeah. Understand, you know. yeah. And then they were not following the table. They weren't, yeah, there were no reference lines drawn on the table either. So what I had was a blank white piece of paper, and they used their imagination. Oh, OK. Slight math mistake there. So do you have a diagram to say how aligned are your accelerometer axis to the actual table? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can, I can sort of, I can sort of compute that for each individual, each individual stroke that, that users interpreted. So I can actually adjust for it after the fact. So when I do the data analysis, right at the beginning, I, I calibrate the axes and then I leave it alone, for for when I look across the whole trace. But if I wanted to determine how much it drifted, I mean, because I know the ground truth of the gesture that they entered, I could actually, you know, adjust adjust how that angle is so that. But even it is a drift versus a constant bias, for example. One, yeah. thing, one thing I notice is when I try to draw a vertical line, I would always keep my finger slightly sort of. Uh, yeah, but that's yeah. that's the definition. You're not doing gravity vector extraction in the beginning. I am. You are. Okay. I am. And where are you doing that? Uh, so I'm, I'm doing this when the finger first touches the surface and it's not moving. That's on your wing. Yes. Oh wow! You have enough horsepower there to do it. Well, well, okay. Right now I'm doing it offline in MATLAB. Right. Yeah, but we are doing it to like this. Uh, this isn't that bucketized. Yes. Yeah, so bucketized. bucketized. We are doing it is, uh, yeah. it's pretty much we bucketized this angle, so like four buckets. And then you sustainable lookup and convert. Uh, yeah, so we're not computing sine, sine, cosine. Yeah. But that, that translates directly to your error protection error. Sure. 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 Yeah. That doesn't help, that's for sure. Yeah. OK, so now uh, that I've kind of shown you uh, what eight gestures look like. Uh, so I want to show you what combining strokes together looks like. So I talked earlier about combining strokes into doing letters. And so this is actually a user entering the letter Z. So that's a combination of diagonal lines and horizontal lines. And the four peaks you see here in red are individual strokes of Z. So this is someone that drew Z you know, with the line in the middle. So you see these are the three first strokes of the Z, right? And then the fourth is the line in the middle, right? And so this is just an example of three instances of this particular user entering Z. Uh, when you look across, so there, there are two users. So in, 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 in the general case, it didn't do that well, right? But 
across so two users, I was able to get 70% accuracy in detecting the letter Z just using these simple heuristics that we've developed so far. So future work for this, right, is doing uh, what I call advanced gesture detection. So if you have something like a left circle up gesture, so say I'm writing the letter B, right, and a B will consist of a vertical line and then kind of two half circles to the right. And maybe the direction that those half circles are made is important to how the letter is constructed. Uh, so we can actually see some interesting features of those motions in the accelerometer right now. We're just not completely sure how to deal with the signals, right? So for example, uh, I have two entries here from one of my users where they did a left circle up and a left circle down. And so for example, the uh, y-axis here, so you see that it's concave and convex in different parts of the curve during the first and second half, right? And then, for example, uh, another thing that we noticed, right? So in the x-axis, if you look at kind of the, the energy of the signal, it's, it's more, there's more energy in the signal on the left half than on the right. So that might be able to give you your di directionality. So one of those two axes will give you directionality, and then the other might tell you that you're drawing a circle, right, because of the characteristics of the centripetal force. Um, I'm not going to say much more here because this is all fairly speculative. Um, but I think a machine learning approach might be able to deal with more complex signals like this. Yep. So on the previous slide, the slide with the Z, were, were you disambiguating, disambiguating that from other characters like an S or an N? <laughs> not, not in this case. So this okay. is basically the user entering the letter Z 10 times in a row. And even that is a little bit, so I'm not doing any time domain analysis right now either. So I think the, the, the key thing right, to, dis, to distinguish different characters from each other would be you know, the gap between groupings of strokes. But this was just knowing beforehand the letter, the letter Z and then trying to figure it out based on the sequence you get. That's right. OK, so, so uh, that, that's all I have for kind of current work. Um, so, so, so to kind of conclude, I, I showed you the sensor fusion approach that we used for detecting gestures on a ring um, using an accelerometer and a microphone. So our next steps, right, so um, we want to add more uh, audio noise robustness. So there are a couple things I mentioned about doing this uh, kind of time domain analysis of the envelope signature to know, you know, what's a spurious noise and what's a stroke. And then the other way might be having this adjustable filter, right? So you could look at the region of frequencies that don't overlap with things that you detected as noise. So maybe you can change the characteristics of that filter as the user is using the ring. Okay, so next, um, you know, being able to adjust for finger rotations using, using reference gestures. So the idea there, right, is so maybe you could even enforce this, right? So maybe like once every 10 strokes, you have the user draw a vertical line and then a horizontal line. And if they've changed their finger orientation a little bit, you could use kind of that reference gesture as a way to, to realign your coordinate space. Um, the third thing, so machine learning. Uh, so you can use an SVM classifier to actually look at all 12 gestures, including the curves. So so far, I just showed heuristic-based results for doing eight. We'd like to be able to get up to 12 and do, do complete letters and sequences of letters. Um, we need to do a more extensive NFC uh, harvesting evaluation, right? So say someone is wearing a form factor ring and they're using their phone during the day. How much do we actually get in practice? So in our Mobesis paper this year, we actually did some analysis. So there's this Live Labs project at Rice University where they had lock, unlock uh, traces from phone usage, right? And that is indicative of an opportunity that you have to harvest energy from NFC because when the phone is unlocked, you're able to harvest power, right? So by looking at those, kinds of characteristics, you get an idea of how often you could recharge the ring. Uh, the next really important thing, right, building a form factor platform. So the components that we've chosen thus far, right, are amenable to miniaturization, right? So these are all just simple off-the-shelf op amps that are available in smaller packages. There's nothing that would prevent us from putting this in a ring size object because we're, we've, we've designed it around a small battery, right? It's, it's a power efficient implementation. So we need to do more user studies, doing things you know, like different, different characters in the same session, uh, looking at you know, having, a, having a camera to be able to better understand how people move their finger around while they're performing gestures. And then finally, um, doing an end-to-end -end evaluation with the ring as an actual UI device. Right? So maybe I'm in my living room, I'm sitting at the coffee table, you know, I'm, I'm playing games on my Xbox, and then I want to decide I want to be able to navigate around that dashboard and select different media, maybe a different game. I happen to be wearing the ring, so instead of I mean I could I could use I could use the table, right? So, so maybe I'm not even playing a game and I don't want to use the controller, right? This might be like a more a more seamless way to interact with things that are in your living room. Um, so of course I have a bunch of acknowledgments. 
So first I want to acknowledge Bodhi has been a great mentor, a lot of really valuable guidance in steering the project in the direction we took. Of course, uh, thanks to G and the rest of the Sensors and Energy group for, for having me as an intern. Uh, I had a lot of really valuable discussions with different people in the lab that helped mature the project. I had a couple of discussions with uh, Matai Filippos and, and Tim Peck. Uh, so one of them is a machine learning guy and the other does stuff with, with UI. So they had a lot of you know, nice ideas that, that, that we incorporated. Um, of course, all the people that contributed gesture data. And finally, my fellow interns had a lot of nice discussions with people. I mean, sometimes the things that help the project the most are you know, random ideas that people have over a dinner conversation. So thanks to them. And, and thank you all for attending. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me after my internship's over, this is my email. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. You use the X and the Y axis for um, designing for identifying the symbols. Mm -hmm. Using the Z axis, would it help in that? Um, so, so it 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 could, right? So, if the finger tilt changes along the Z axis, right? I mean, maybe that would give you additional hints that 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 might be able to let you tell one character from another. For example, it could also let you more accurately choose the beginning and end of the audio envelope. I mean. So we detect that the movement starts just based on the sound, and then after the fact, right, based on when that envelope went above and below a threshold, that's where we know to look at the accelerometer data. The fact that throughout the day, people touch surfaces all the time and get acceleration events all the time. How do we differentiate between a random touch on the surface, me adjusting my glasses, me scratching my head, me touching my legs? Yeah. How do you appreciate that versus an actual gesture? The first tap is the... Right, yeah, well, so, so firstly, you have a strong, you can, you can enforce like a strong user tap to start interacting with the device, right? So that might help eliminate some of the, some of the tapping type things. Maybe I'm not tapping really hard throughout the day, but maybe, it, it might happen sometimes, but less often. Um, uh, so maybe you can do more careful frequency analysis, right? Maybe not all surfaces look exactly the same. Um, the other bit too, right, is um, so say if you're trying to identify different different uh, gesture inputs, and all the time I'm just getting garbage, right? I mean, obviously you would probably want to turn the thing back off. You're looking for a tap and a slide. Yes. Not just a tap. Right, but Demetrios was saying that maybe I tap my face and then I slide. Yeah, maybe the oh, okay. Maybe tap twice. <laughs> yeah, maybe tap twice. It's tap twice and then a slide. Yeah. And then if that's not good enough, three times. And two slides. Regardless of education, right? so how yeah. is this uh, sensors and techniques uh, are they sensitive to the kind of, let's uh, say, uh, angry touch? I mean, in speech recognition, say, if uh -huh. you recognize or can recognize, usually a common mistake is the human subject will speak louder or uh, uh, slower, that's actually making this worse. So in this case, if I touch, say, uh, harder, and uh, so what will that, so for the characteristics you base So you're saying, so, so based on, so, so you're saying the user's emotional state, the characteristics of the way that they enter strokes and characters might change, so and that might, yeah. The uh, user may have a chance to learn to adapt to the device so that if they made mistakes, the next time they immediately know how to adjust that to compensate that. So so either so do you see this opportunity? I think this device basically everybody will have a learning curve to adapt to sure. right? So Yeah. Yeah so you do need learning in both ways, right? So you can have the ring learn what a user does and also you can have the user learn when their gestures aren't being input properly, right? So one way you can do that, right, is so maybe you have like a plug-in or something on the device that you're interacting with, and maybe you have some non-obtrusive, something like a, like a colored region or something that lets you know whether your inputs are good or bad. You could also think of having something like, you know, a multicolor LED that turns on very briefly on the ring to let you know kind of how you're doing, but. Or, or, or changing the threshold itself could help, right? Because if you're moving it really fast, you yeah. have a higher voltage, but if you're moving really slowly, sure, your acceleration could be slower. Yeah. But there, there definitely, I think, will be a sort of user learning and adapting to the thing. Because there will be, most likely, in all of these things, there will be a kind of visual or audible input feedback to the user, right? 
Right. Uh, so, okay, we don't actually have a technique developed to do that, but our intuition, right, is that strokes that correspond to one letter should usually be grouped more closely together than ones that are part of different characters. So I don't know whether or not that's true. It's probably true, you know, maybe 80% of the time, and then 20% of the time you have to do something. Maybe the language model based right. with the, you know, writing a word, then that doesn't make sense. Kind of right, right. So the, the context of the use case matters, right? So maybe if I'm doing, uh, yeah, it, it depends on what, on what type of text you're entering, or I mean, if you're doing simpler gestures, that might not matter so much. But yeah. Some of the early written uh, character recognition systems like Palm Pilot and Handspring mm -hmm. had predefined characters you had to use because they couldn't recognize the actual letters. But that relied on the fact that um, they could detect when you picked your finger up. Yeah. Um, but you can't actually even detect when the person's got their finger up versus down as long as it's still, right? So if I do a up and then to the side, you don't know uh -huh. if I pick my finger up in between or not necessarily. Well, um, that's not necessarily true. So you might be able to detect something from the accelerometer. Right now, we don't, we don't depend on that, right? So you might see a change in the z-axis to, to detect that the finger is moving up. Um, but I mean, we do know that those are two distinct strokes, but we don't necessarily know right, whether or not, right now whether or not the finger has been lifted. Even with a single character, yeah. like uh, anything that has a vertical and a horizontal, like a T, a plus, and an L, right. they all look different. Well, so again, you can look at the gap between the strokes. So I looked at a lot of the user data, right? And say, for example, you're writing the letter A, and you have those two diagonal lines. Those two are spaced very, very close together. But say if you're writing the letter T, you're drawing a vertical line, lifting your finger, moving over to draw the horizontal, you see a lot more space between the two. Another, another fair answer would be, given that writing letters with the hand is not the most pleasant thing to do, maybe that is, may not be the killer scenario for this application than to manipulate some UI space. Right, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm drawing X's, triangles, circles, squares, you know, that, that kind of thing. Rely on the gap in time between the strokes, then yeah. the angry, angry strokes might start to affect things, right? Because people will do things very slowly and deliberately, and then you can't use that time. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah. Maybe relative. That's why you push all that to the other <laughs> layer and to the more. Yeah. That's when you need the sensor. <laughs> sensor <yeah. laughs> we need to get the GSR sensor to work so we know uh, how angry they are, yeah. Okay. Thank you.